Have you ever made a commitment without fully knowing what you were getting yourself into? When I was uh, a sophomore in college, I was 19 years old, I knew that God was calling me to ministry, but I didn't really know what to do about that. And so one idea that I came up with was that I would start serving somewhere in a church. And I didn't really know what to do, what, what I wanted to do, what my passions were, but I reached out to a pastor in the area and I made a commitment that I was not prepared to keep. I told him I would do whatever he needed. Now, in my mind, whatever he needed was maybe like, like preaching on Easter Sunday and saving the whole church or something, and, and, and it, it wasn't. In fact, it was one need that he had that he had been praying for, that they were praying for male volunteers for their midweek kids program. They had a, a kids program for elementary age kids, and they had um, like no, no male volunteers. So it, I was like a, an answered prayer, I guess, even though that is not my intention. But now, now I have the greatest respect in the world for any of you that are teachers, um, any of you that work with kids. We know we just finished our VBS week, and if you helped with that, you are literally a hero. Um, I saw pictures, and it looked like chaos to me. So <laughs> if you did that, I, I, again, it's just incredible what you've done. But this was something that I was pretty confident that I was not going to be successful doing. And it didn't take long to see that I was right. Um, my, my first night of volunteering, I showed up and I was assigned a small group of kids that I was going to be like their small group leader. And they gave me a lesson ahead of time. And the lesson that I was supposed to teach these kids was about patience. And so I thought about it for a while and I said, okay, like, what, what can I do? So I brought a bag of candy um, as the bribe. Um, and, and I told the kids, I said, okay, if you guys get through this lesson, if you answer all my questions and, and do everything I ask, at the end, you can get a few pieces of candy. And you guys, I thought I was like so clever. Like, I, I was so proud of myself for thinking of this. Like, I'm the best teacher ever. Um, and, and so about halfway through the lesson, one, one of the kids raised his hand and, and he said, I want some candy. And I said, okay, but you, you know, you have to be, and I waited for him to say the word patient, and he didn't. So I said, I said, you have to be patient. And he looked at me and he started to cry. And it wasn't like tearing up, it was like crying, crying. Like, like other teachers were looking around concerned for the safety of this child. That was his level of crying. And I froze. Like I didn't know what to do. I don't think I even knew this kid's name. It was my first night serving at this church. Like what do you do when a kid just starts crying? So, someone please tell me afterwards, because I still don't know. <laughs> just find me after the service, okay? So I kind of just froze, there was a little maybe moment of panic and I kind of just like threw candy at him. I was like, here you go! <laughs> <laughs> and after that moment, those kids knew that they had me. <laughs> Anytime that they wanted candy, they knew exactly what to do and those kids probably still have cavities from all the candy I gave them that year. And that is when I knew that I was not called to kids ministry. <laughs> What comes to your mind when you think about serving? We've been going through this series called The Disciplines of Grace, how God uses different disciplines, different actions to show us and to give us his grace. And today we are talking about serving. Maybe for you, when you think of serving, you have a, a story similar to mine. Maybe not in that you were exhorted out of candy, but like so you, were, you signed up for something and you didn't really know what you were getting yourself into. And maybe it was difficult, maybe even overwhelming. Maybe for some of us, when we think of serving, we think of a, a trip that we've been on, a mission trip, or this experience where we went with the purpose of serving other people. For others still, maybe we think of something that we do for our family, for friends, for our neighbors or community. But maybe for, for some of us here today, when we think of serving, we think, that is not something that I want to do. If I'm being honest with you, I really like it when other people serve me, but I really don't want to do it for others. Whatever your answer is, whatever comes to mind when you think of this word serving, I believe that God has something for each one of us today. We're going to be looking to the book of Philippians, which is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in a town called Philippi. And he wrote this to a church that had been going through issues that I think some of them will be able to relate to. And so I'm going to read to you uh, Philippians chapter 2, the first five verses. It says this, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete 
by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. These verses are, are so good and powerful, but they're, they're extra special to me, actually, because these are the verses that were read at my wedding ceremony. I remember planning uh, with, with Judy, we were kind of planning through what we wanted our ceremony to look like, and we decided that we wanted someone to read scripture for us, and these were the verses that we landed on. Because we thought, you know, what better way to, to start our marriage, to start this new life together than with a commitment, a commitment to live in humility, to put the other's interests before ourselves. And we had a friend read it for us, and it was this beautiful moment where I really think that we thought this is how our life was going to go. And that lasted about 24 hours. Um, I, we, we, we decided that actually the next day that we uh, were going to road trip to our honeymoon. We did a road trip to the beach instead of flying. Um, and I don't, I don't want to call anybody out here. <laughs> but let me just say that we road trip very differently. One of us, you see, wants to maybe stop every hour or so to take a rest stop or to get a snack. And one of us wants to get to the hotel before our stay ends. I don't know if there are any engaged couples here today, but my advice to you, take a road trip now and just work out those issues. <laughs> this is just a, just a kind of a small, maybe even silly example of something that is true for each one of us. It is really hard to put the other's interests before yourself. It is really hard to live a life of humility. And yet that's what Paul is showing us in these verses. He shows us the humility of Christ, the humility of Christ. A while ago, I came upon a definition of the word humility. It's a, there's a book entitled Humility, True Greatness, and it frames this word in a really interesting way. You see, I think for, for many of us, when we think of this word humility, it almost kind of sounds weak, doesn't it? It sounds like, you know, I, I can't allow myself to think that I'm good at something. Or even if I think it, I can't let other people know that. And it's almost like keeping what you have secret. But what if we define humility differently? What if we define it as it's written in this book? It says this, humility is honestly assessing ourselves in light of God's holiness in our sinfulness. In other words, humility is not about keeping your gifts quiet. It's realizing that all the accomplishments that we can achieve are not individual awards. They come because of God's holiness and they are given to us to serve others. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less and others more. This is Paul's message to the Philippian church. This was a group of people that have been struggling with issues caused by selfishness, caused by strife, caused by conceit. It's one of the reasons he wrote the letter. In this time of writing, humility was something that was seen as weak. That was seen as kind of the opposite of what you should be striving for. And yet his message is to fill your days thinking of how you can elevate other people's needs. How you can fight this battle of selfishness and conceit with a life of humility. To constantly ask yourself this one question. How can I better serve my neighbor? We're faced with that same battle, this battle of knowing what we are called to and yet realizing that there's a part of us that really loves to be seen as successful, as talented, as great. But we go back to verse 1, which tells us that it is a mark of one who's been encouraged by Christ to live this life of humility. If, if Jesus has truly changed me, if I recognized him as my Savior, then it will be shown by the way that I live humbly every day. Because every day I grow in the understanding of just how much he has done for me. No longer will I let pride control my life. I'm going to put myself second. I think Paul maybe knew that this was going to be difficult because he didn't stop here. He didn't just give these instructions and say, good luck. But he gave us an example. He gave us an example of one that did this perfectly. As we move on, we see the emptying of Christ, the emptying of Christ. 
Verse 5, we'll continue and pick up in our story. It says this, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. A while ago, uh, Judy and I helped lead a, a mission trip uh, with middle and high school students to Nashville, Tennessee. And while we were there, we were working with this mission organization. And the last night of our trip, the staff there led us in this worship service. And at the end, they had this tradition to do a foot washing ceremony. Now, for some of you, maybe you've been a part of that. For, for others, it's, it's a new idea. But basically, a foot washing ceremony points us to what Jesus did shortly before he was betrayed. John 13 tells us the story that he was sitting with his disciples, and, with his followers, and he kneels down before them, taking the form of a servant, and he washes their feet. And so this is something that kind of points us to that. And so I knew this was coming, and, and I had the opportunity to, to have my feet washed by one of the staff members there. And then my role was to wash the feet of some of our students that were with us. And I'll just be honest with you guys, I was not looking forward to this night. This was something that in my own selfishness and my own pride, um, I personally think feet are gross. I don't know about the rest of you guys. Um, especially feet that have been working in the hot Tennessee sun um, all day. Like, it, it, they're just gross. I think I, I can stand on that firmly. Um, and, and so, personally, I, just, I really was dreading this. I really was. And yet, looking back on it, I can truly say that it was such a powerful, powerful experience for our group. Not just because it was kind of a bonding thing for, for the students and us, because it was, but because it so clearly pointed me towards what Jesus has done. Towards the fact that he was willing to lower himself. He was willing to empty himself for me. This is the example, and this is the, the mindset that Paul teaches about. If we are to serve others, we have to empty ourselves. As we look at verse 6, it, it tells us that Jesus made himself nothing. That can also translate literally to he emptied himself. It's this idea of Jesus making the choice to give up the position that he had, to give up his place in heaven, and to lower himself to become a man. But not, not just to come as a man, but to come as a baby. Not to come as a king, but as a carpenter. The one who is in very nature God, coming as a servant. So much of our, our theology, the things that we believe about God, are informed by these verses here. About Jesus being of the same nature as the Father, which makes him equally God. And yet also having the nature of a man, making him human. He made the choice to give up his privilege, something that we call kenosis. And he, it, it tells us that he never stopped being God. He simply added humanity to his godliness. Through all this stuff, all this truth that we see, it points us to one thing, that Jesus was willing to empty himself, to do something that was completely beneath him. And that is the mindset to which we have been called. And for me, that is really hard. It is so hard when we are faced with that choice. It is hard to, to not just simply make an excuse, to think to ourselves, you know, I, I just don't, I don't feel like I have the time for this, or it's not worth what time I have. To think maybe there's someone else who could do it better than me, or, you know, simply, I just don't want to do it. But what would change if we had the mindset that Jesus had? What would happen if we asked the questions, what parts of me do I need to empty? Are there parts of my life that I'm holding on to that is actually holding me back from who God is calling me to be? Are there parts of my life that I'm holding on to with my spouse and with my kids, with my friends and at my school, at the workplace? Where, what part of me am I being selfish about? What part of me am I holding on to that actually if I let go, God would do something truly powerful in my life? And how can I start to let go? What makes this so difficult is that serving takes obedience. Verse 8, he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Now, we shouldn't just breeze past this because we've probably heard it before in church. Just truly think about this. This is incredible. 
This man who was also God, who was guilty of no crime, was willing to die a humiliating death, one that was saved for the worst of criminals because he knew what that death would accomplish. This is not what was fair. This is not what he deserved. He deserved to be praised, and yet he received hatred. He deserved to be served. And yet, what did he say? He said that he did not come to be served, but to serve. To pour his life out as a ransom for men. By the example left for us, it becomes obvious that Jesus' mindset was never about what he deserved. And so if we are to have this Christ-like mindset, we must move past what is fair and what we think deserve, what we think we deserve, and towards what will glorify God the most. This is a new way of thinking and living. It's a change in perspective. I think back to the example that I gave of this road trip that, that Judy and I went on. Just a, a small example of different arguments and disagreements that we all have in relationships. What would have changed just in that small time on the road if we didn't see it as a way to win or lose and me versus her, but simply as a small way to serve my wife? as a small way to put her interests above mine because I remember and I know that when I try to win, everybody loses. And yet when I choose to give up my position, God has given the glory. This is the example that we are called to, but it is not the end of our story. Paul continues to walk the church through the life of Jesus, showing them the exaltation of Christ, the exaltation of Christ. We'll pick up our story in Philippians 2, verse 9. It says this. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. When I was growing up, um, like many of you, my parents would ask me to, to do chores. And like the good kid I was, I would always do them with a smile on my face and a great attitude. <laughs> yeah, that was a joke, you can laugh. Um, <laughs> no, I, I didn't like chores, I tried to avoid them, but the thing that made it even worse was the day that I found out that I had uh, friends at school that got paid to do the same things I was doing for free. And so I calmly sat down with my parents and I asked them, why don't you love me? No, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But I, I asked them, why don't I get paid for this? And for those of you that are parents, you probably have this response in mind. They very calmly and kindly told me that my payment came in the form of the roof over my head and the food on the table and the clothes on my back. And they'd be happy to, to pay me for the one to two hours of chores I do every week instead. And that ended that conversation pretty quick. But what if I told you that there's a part of me that hasn't changed since that day? That there's a part of me that loves to get a reward when I serve. That even sometimes while I'm serving, there's a question going on in the back of my head, what's in it for me? If you can relate to that feeling at all, when we read these verses at first, it seems like this is the payoff. This is the reward. We see this word, therefore, showing this cause and effect relationship. Because of what Jesus did, he was exalted. He was given this ultimate reward. Because he endured humiliation, he is given praise. Because he took on the name of a man, he is given the name above every name. Because he became a servant, he is bowed down to as Lord. And man, is it tempting to make that the lesson. To make that the lesson and say, you know what, if you want this reward, if you want to be praised, and if you want the glory, just serve for a little bit and then just wait, because it's coming. But what if God wants to teach us something different here today? What if it's not about our gain? What if it's just about God's glory? Look at verse 11 again. Everything that happens, happens to the glory of God the Father. And the question I have for you today is this. Is that enough for you? Is it enough for you to live a life serving other people, living humbly, emptying yourself, and to do it all so that God gets the glory and not you. As we talk about the spiritual discipline of serving, 
There's nothing inherently spiritual about serving other people. You and I both know plenty of people that have no faith in God and that they serve other people. They do nice things for others. The thing that makes it spiritual is that when we do those things, we do them so that Christ is exalted, so that he gets the credit, he gets the glory, and not us. A few years back, there was um, a, a term that became popular, especially on the internet, called uh, a humble brag. I don't know if any of you have heard this term before. Um, if not, it's exactly as it sounds. It's bragging about yourself, but trying to do it in a humble way. Now, I know none of us have ever done this, um, but let me just read some real life examples from celebrities and different people that I saw online that have mastered the art of the humble brag. So this is one. It always feels a little odd to me when I get recognized randomly in public. I never know what to say. I'm glad it doesn't happen often. She's not glad it doesn't happen often. <laughs> How about this one? I just stepped on gum. Who spits gum on a red carpet? <laughs> like, just say you're on a red carpet. It's fine. Um, I just did something very selfless, but more importantly, it was genuine, and I know it means a lot to the person in the long run. <laughs> this one's my favorite. This is the last one. I'd be the worst at the price is right. I brought $20,000 to buy a monitor. It cost $350. Cool. <laughs> Now, these are extreme examples, but, but I'll just speak for myself and just say that I love it when people know how selfless I am. I do, I, and that's part, a part of me that I need to work through, but, but Paul's instructions are this, to no longer pursue our own gain, but to live a life serving others, to approach every day with the mindset of Christ solely for the glory of God, in the big things and in the small things. You know, so often I think that when we think of serving, we think that we have to, like, go across the world and build houses, and, and that's a really great way to serve. I know for, for many of us, even some students among us, we've been on trips even this summer or in the past, and you've done incredible work, and through the work that you've done, Christ is exalted. And yet, what if I told you that you exalt Christ just as much when you honor your parents, when you do what they ask without expecting a reward? It's true for all of us. When, when we help out a coworker who's struggling, Christ is exalted. When we sign up and show up for this neighborhood serve day, Christ is exalted. When we bring a, a meal to a family who's going through a hard time, Christ is exalted. It's these daily steps that we take. And as we take them, God gets the glory. And as God gets the glory, we receive grace. And as we receive grace, we become more and more like him. That is your reward. Throughout this series, we've been ending each message with a challenge, a challenge for the week to take what God is saying to us and to make it real in our lives. And so this week, we want to challenge you to change your mindset, to change your mindset, to every day go out of your way and intentionally recognize situations where there is a, a, a need to fill, an opportunity to serve. And where your first reaction is this, man, I do not want to do that. Or someone really needs to do something about that, but not me. Or, you know, I, it's just not worth my time. To recognize those situations and then to remember the example that Jesus has left for us. The example that we see in Philippians of the one who emptied himself, who lowered himself in service to each one of us. And then you challenge is to serve in a way that brings you no credit or glory and exalts Christ. This is your challenge. And I truly believe that living it out has the ability to change your community, to change your family, and to change yourself. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the example that you have left. The example of the one who has gone out of his way, who has made the choice to lower himself, to empty himself. God, you've challenged us to live with humility, to live in a way that brings you glory and not us. And so I just pray that you would empower us to do that now, that you would show us situations where you have called us to serve and to joyfully 
fill that need for others, knowing that it will bring you glory. We love you, and we pray this all in your name. Amen. Well, hey, we just want to again say that we're so glad that you're here. If something's going on in your life that you need prayer for, there's a prayer team that will be up front at the end of the service, and we would love to honor you and serve you in that way. Don't forget to sign up for Neighborhood Serve Day on your Chapel Street app. You'll be hearing more about that. And again, we hope you have a great day. You're dismissed.